Hello and welcome to Shredder Zoo. Today we're taking a look at an early Cretaceous dinosaur that was discovered before anyone really knew what dinosaurs were. This is the Iguanodon, and it was only the second dinosaur to be discovered after the Megalosaurus. There is some debate about who actually discovered it. Some sources claim it was Gideon Mantell, an English obstetrician, geologist and paleontologist. Others claim it was his wife, Mary Ann. But whoever it was, they discovered the fossil teeth in a quarry in Whiteman's Green in Sussex, England in 1822. Mantell presented the find to the Geological Society of London, but the members there dismissed the teeth as belonging to a rhinoceros, or possibly a fish. A year later, the teeth were shown to Georges Cuvier, a French naturalist who you may have heard me talk about during the Megaloceros educational video. Initially, Cuvier agreed with the Geological Society members that they were the teeth of a rhino. This caused Mantel to put aside the teeth for a while, even though the very next day Cuvier doubted his initial interpretation. It wasn't until William Buckland caused shockwaves to the scientific community by describing the Megalosaurus in 1824 that the attention returned to Mantel's collection of fossils. Buckland himself took a look and realised they belonged to a creature similar to the Megalosaurus although Buckland believed they belonged to a carnivore. Encouraged by Buckland's identification, Mantel sent the teeth to Cuvier for a second opinion. This time, Cuvier confirmed that they were reptilian and probably a herbivore. With Cuvier's significant reputation behind him, Mantel was able to fully explore his findings. At this time, with little known about prehistoric animals, most scientists looked to modern animals to give them an idea about how they may have looked. Samuel Stutchby, an English naturalist, noticed that the teeth resembled those of an iguana. Now that Mantel had a close match, he began his reconstruction. The obvious thing to him, and probably most others of the time, was to scale the size of the iguana tooth to the fossil tooth and see how many times larger the fossil was. Mantel then measured the body of the iguana and then multiplied this by how many times the fossil tooth was larger than an iguana tooth. The result of this was a colossal 18 metres long. This was a gross overestimate. And while versions of this technique are still used today, they are strictly restricted to animals that are known to have at least the same body shape. The similarity of the fossil to the iguana teeth was the inspiration for the name. Initially, Mantel wanted to name it Iguanosaurus, meaning iguana lizard. However, as Mantel's friend William Daniel Conbeer pointed out, the iguana is a lizard. He then suggested Iguanoids, which means Iguana-like, and Iguanodon, which means Iguana-tooth. And of course, Mantel chose Iguanodon. A more complete specimen of a similar animal was discovered in a quarry in Maidstone, Kent, in 1834, which Mantel soon acquired. He was led to identify it as an Iguanodon based on its distinctive teeth. The Maidstone slab was utilised in the first skeletal re reconstructions and artistic renderings of the Iguanodon. But due to its incompleteness, Mantel made some mistakes, the most famous of which was the placement of what he thought was a horn on the nose. This, of course, turned out to be the famous thumb spike. Around this time, tensions began to rise between Mantel and Richard Owen, an ambitious scientist with much better funding and society connections. Owen believed that the creatures were not giant lizards, but more mammal-like, more like huge, scaly-skinned elephants with mouths full of sharp teeth. A few years before his death, Mantell did realise that Owen was wrong in his ideas of dinosaurs being heavy and bulky animals. He noted the slender forelimbs of the Iguanodon that would form a key part in deciphering its true form and possible lifestyle. In 1852, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was commissioned to build the first ever life-size models of extinct animals. He had originally planned to just recreate extinct mammals before deciding on building dinosaurs as well. But as Mantell died in 1852, he was unable to take part in the reconstruction, and so Richard Owen advised Hawkins on the dinosaur's appearance. The result was the unveiling of the Crystal Palace sculptures in 1854 and the world was exposed to Owen's interpretations. Nearly two dozen life-size sculptures of various prehistoric animals were built out of concrete sculpted over a steel and brick framework, including two iguanodonts, one standing one resting on its belly. 
in 1878, a collection of bones from at least 38 individual Iguanodon were found within a Belgian coal mine. These were reconstructed by the Belgian paleontologist Louis Dollo in 1882. These bones combine to create complete individual animals. With these reconstructions, Dollo proved Owen was wrong about the dinosaur's appearance. Dollo also discovered that the spike that Mantell had placed on the snout actually belonged on the hand, where it was the thumb. The overall depiction of the Iguanodon was now of a larger but more lightweight animal that stood on its hind legs. However, while Dollo's reconstruction was more accurate and vastly superior to anything before it, there were still some problems. The main fault with this reconstruction is that the tail is curved. This is something that would have been impossible in the living animal because ossified tendons along the caudal vertebrae held the tail rigid so that it could not bend. Also, the posture of the body was in an almost upright walking position, something that would have also been impossible because of the tail's true construction. In order for the animal to assume this pose, its tail would have to be broken. Today we have a much better understanding of how the Iguanodon appeared. It was mainly a quadrupedal animal that could shift to a bipedal stance. It was around 10 meters long, although some may have been as big as 13 meters, and weighed around 3.4 tons. They are actually depicted rather small here in Ark and should be much bigger. The hand had five fingers, the middle three were inflexible and positioned close together for bearing weight when in a quadrupedal stance. The thumb was of course the famous spike, which could have been used for defence or foraging for food, and the fifth finger was long and flexible and could have been used to grip food. Here in Ark, it is depicted as being able to run faster while on all fours, but this isn't actually true. It would have had a top speed of around 15 miles per hour while in a bipedal stance, but it would not have been able to gallop while in a quadrupedal stance. Well, that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I hope you've enjoyed the video and you've learned something new. I would really appreciate it if you took the time to hit the like button and leave me a comment down below. I just want to remind you that you can join my Discord server, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and you can become a patron. All of the links can be found in the description. I hope to see you next time here at Shredder Zoo. Goodbye.